Good evening, congregation. I sincerely apologize for keeping you waiting for a couple of moments, but you know, having our faith tested is always a good thing. Count it joy, my brothers and sisters, says the Lord. I try to think on my way here if, how many times I've preached. Yeah, I think it's about the fourth or the fifth time that I'm here preaching from this pulpit tonight, and every time it's been such a great privilege for me. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I honor the Lord for the opportunity, but also say thank you to the elders, the congregation itself. May the Lord really bless us through our handling of His holy word this evening, and I also bring a hearty welcome from, or uh, greetings from Antipas Reformed Baptist Church in Pretoria that I have the privilege of uh, serving as pastor. You may open your Bibles, dear congregation, to the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Philippians 4, verses 1 to 7. And the theme that I want to speak to you about tonight from these verses is God's gracious gift in Christ of true and lasting peace in a fallen world. Something that we need to be reminded of again and again and again. The true and the lasting peace that we have from God only in our Lord Jesus Christ. According to the story of, that we read in the book of Acts, especially chapter 16 in the book of Acts, we read that the Apostle Paul and his associates spent time in the city of Philippi during his second missionary journey. And uh, there was no Jewish synagogue in the city. Uh, that we um, know about. And so Paul, he went with his associates outside of the city on the Sabbath day to a regular place of prayer. It was well known in that day. And there they started to share the gospel. And a number of individuals came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Among others, there was Lydia, the businesswoman that originally came from Thyatira her and her household came to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. Uh, that's in Acts chapter 16, verses 14 and 15. And a bit later, also through their ministry, we know that the Philippian jailer came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, along with his household, in Acts 16, verses 23 to 34. And so, very soon, the church in Philippi was established. And this church really helped and supported the Apostle Paul's ministry with all their resources. When they learned that Paul was arrested in Rome for his preaching of the gospel, uh, a time that we read of in Acts chapter 28, verses 30 and 31, they immediately set apart their pastor, Epaphroditus, and sent him to Paul in Rome to go and encourage him under house arrest. We read about that in Philippians chapter 2. If you would turn to me, uh, with me uh, to Philippians 2, verse 25. Paul writes, he says, I have thought it necessary to send to you, back to you, Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker, fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my needs. For he's been longing for you all. We know he says here that Epaphroditus became sick, nearly to the point of death. And then from verse 29, he says to the congregation, Now receive him back in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So he visited Paul in Rome while he was under house arrest. And uh, along with Epaphroditus, this congregation sent a financial offering also to ease Paul's time, make it more comfortable under house arrest. We read about that in Philippians 4, verse 18, if you would turn there. Paul writes, I've received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And this was not the only time that the Philippian congregation supported Paul's ministry financially, uh, we read that at least once while he was in Corinth and at least twice while he was in Thessalonica, they also did this. 
Look at uh, chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Paul writes, And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I was left in Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in the giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Now, this letter to the Philippians was written for Paul to acknowledge and express gratitude for the congregation's financial uh, assistance to him, but also in turn to help them through his teaching on how to live the Christian life. And that's the overarching theme of the Philippian letter, the practical living of the Christian life. Therefore, in chapter 1, Paul offers the Philippians um, encouragement for the Christian life. In chapter 2, he uh, provides them with examples for the Christian life, mentioning the Lord Jesus Christ. He mentions himself and his co-worker Timothy. He mentions their own pastor, Epaphroditus. In chapter 3, he offers the congregation warnings for the Christian life. Warnings that was relevant to them in their time. He mentions two false gospels that, as it were, were standing on the extreme ends of a spectrum. Uh, false gospels which they were to reject. He speaks out firstly against Judaism. Uh, that is the Judaizers' is false gospel of Christ plus works for salvation. Now, these first century Jews, they did believe in Jesus, but they taught that faith in Jesus was not enough to be saved. You have to supplement your faith in Jesus by your own performance, obedience to the Old Testament law. And uh, the circumcision was a big thing to them. Now, Paul rejects, strongly condemns this idea. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, look there with me. He says, and listen how he calls them, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, referring there to those who circumcise uh, and see that circumcision is necessary for salvation. In verse 9 of chapter 3, he says that the Christian, talking about himself, should be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ alone, the righteousness from God that depends on faith alone. That's on the one end. On the other end of the spectrum, he also speaks himself out against the antinomians of his day. Now, antinomianism is a, a word made up of two Greek words. Anti, which means against or in the place of, and nomos, which means law. But these were people that were against any kind of law. Uh, they were lawless, they were licentious, and they perverted Paul's teaching on salvation through grace alone. They made it mean that a Christian can live as he sees fit without any moral restraint because we are most now saved through grace alone. Now, Paul also strongly condemns this as we read in Philippians 3 verse 19. He says of these antinomian, antinomians, their end is not heaven, it's destruction. Their God whom they serve is not the God we know of heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is their belly. Their glory is in their shame, in the sins that they revel in, with minds set on earthly things. Now this is all just to sketch the scene for you. In our text, Paul now goes on. In the light of these two false gospels, he exhorts the Philippians to keep Christ central in their Christian walk. The Judaizers and the Antinomians drifted away from Christ's centrality in the Christian life. The Judaizers made Christ only an addition to their old Old Testament their own Old Testament religious practices. The antinomians made Christ only an addition to their own wickedness. This is not what Paul wants. In contrast, if the Philippian congregation kept Christ central, and even we today, if we keep Christ central, then they and we 
will experience assurance of salvation. And we will experience the fulfillment of the promise that is made in chapter 4, verses 7 here. Namely, that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And this is the message that you and I need so much, is it not? To keep Christ central, so that we might experience the peace that God promises. Not a peace that, like the world gives, but a peace from above that is true, a peace that is lasting. I mean, we had level six load shedding this week. It plunged us into physical darkness. It was long stretches that we did not have any light during uh, this week. And similarly, among us, I know, even among us tonight here, there are people who are struggling in a form of spiritual darkness for various reasons. Maybe you are facing challenges with financial deficit, financial shortage. Maybe you're facing challenges with broken relationships, be it at home or at the workplace, in the family, in the neighborhood where you live, challenges with physical health, chronic pain, struggles, challenges with emotional turbulence, shock, chemical imbalances, unjust treatment, persecution, all of these things. And therefore, this message is relevant even tonight for you and me. And in the text, through the inspired pen of the Apostle Paul, God then gives the Philippian believers, as well as us, three guidelines. And this is the hangers that you can hang your thoughts on if you want to, if you want to hang up. Three guidelines of how we should keep Christ, who is the source of true and lasting peace from God. How we should keep Him central in our lives, so that we are not overwhelmed by the dark clouds of worry, of anxiety, of fear, of despondency, of depression. That we would not give in to these things because of our circumstances in this fallen world. But rather that we might enjoy in our innermost beings the true and lasting peace from God. The peace that transcends all understanding, regardless of what we face in this world. With this in our minds, let us now read then Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. After this, I'll pray for us. Philippians chapter 4 from verse 1 says, Therefore, my brothers, after having warned them of these false gospels, whom, brothers whom I love, sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown in the Lord, Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are on the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness, your kindness, your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And as he says in the end of verse 9, the God of peace will be with you. Let's close our eyes in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it is again with great humility that we bow ourselves before you, thanking you for the opportunity that we have again tonight as your people, your beloved ones in Christ, Come to your holy, inspired, authoritative truth in the Bible. Speak to our hearts and minds through your word and spirit. Lord, And come and encourage us. Challenge us as you see fit. Work with us, Lord, that we might live changed lives. And that by the wisdom that you give, 
that we would know how to apply this to our lives in the circumstances that every one of us lives in. Dear God, that we might be live lives to your glory. That we might shine forth the wonder that is our God. Be with us tonight. And do as you see fit through the preaching of your word. This we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The first guideline in our text is stand firm in Christ, beloved. Stand firm in Christ. Look at verses 1 to 3 again. <coughs> the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I love, whom I long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are on the book of life. Now Paul uses the Greek term stako here, meaning to remain immovable in one place. As he says here, in the Lord. They were not to move away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it was Paul and his associates that first preached Christ and the gospel to these Philippian believers, the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in the redemption of Christ alone. And they led the Philippian believers to Christ through spirit-wrought repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. And it is in the Christ of this gospel that he preached that he wants them to stand firm. And this would mean, obviously, in the context here, that they were not to move away from the true Christ of the true gospel to those false gospels propagated by the Judaists and the Antinomians. Now so far we gather that the Philippians have stood firm in the gospel of Christ that Paul preached to them and therefore he addresses them and refers to them with such tenderness. Did you see that in verse 1? We see something of the pastoral heart of Paul here that we all need to have towards one another. He says, uh, my brothers, my sisters, whom I love, whom I long for, my joy, my crown. He calls them my beloved. Now, his wish for them, whom he loved, was to continue in this way that they were immovable in the Lord. And then, um, The desire was also, this desire of Paul that they should stand firm was also why he entreated, exhorted Euodia and Syntyche to be in, of the same mind, as he says here in verse 2, that uh, they should agree in the Lord. Now we infer from Paul's writing here that these women were prominent in the congregation, that these women had great influence in the congregation of the Philippians. I mean, if you look at the second half of verse 3, he says about them, they have labored side by side with me in the gospel. And together with Clement, a prominent uh, one of his associates, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. They had great influence in uh, the church there. Uh, they seem to have fallen out with one another, over which we don't know. And it's uh, maybe a bit of pastoral wisdom that Paul doesn't include the reason here in a public letter addressed to the entire congregation. Anyway, we don't know, but he entreats them that they should make peace. Why? Because their discord was undermining the congregation's firm-footedness in Christ. And that always happens if influential members of the church have a falling out with one another. Paul also asks the shepherd teacher here, Epaphroditus, with whom he sends the letter back to them from Rome whom he calls here in the beginning of verse 3, um, his true companion, to intervene between these two women, to help them to be reconciled through his discipleship. In other words, and this is an important lesson that we learn here, Epaphroditus was to nip this discord, this disunity in the bud, so that it would not be a cause for stumbling, that the congregation would not be swerved from their firm-footedness in Christ. When I was a young boy, I loved fishing in the ocean. 
I was never very good at it, but my grandfather and father was very good at it. And from a young boy, when we went to the Hans Bay, Pearly Beach area, um, they would take me along with them, and uh, I could never cast very far. I was a young boy, so I walked into the ocean for a ways and sat on a rock, and there I cast. And then I spent time really in, the, in God's creation, under his blue light, waiting for the fish to bite, and never... In those times that I think, sure, I should be aware now, this rock is going to slip away from under me. The thought never came up in my mind. Because from the beginning of God's creation, that rock has stood firm there. It is not moved. It's not tossed this way and that way by ocean currents, by the winds. And likewise, the Philippian believers, as well as you and me, beloved, we have to stand firm in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and in our enjoyment of a living, an intimate, a personal relationship with God that the gospel affords us. We are to enjoy assurance of salvation and the true and lasting peace of God in our circumstances. Stand firm in the true Christ of the true gospel, beloved. Notwithstanding your circumstances in this fallen world, a second guideline that Paul mentions here is seek joy in Christ. Not only stand firm in Christ, but seek joy in Christ. Look again with me at verses 4 and 5. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone because the Lord is at hand. Now, Paul uses the Greek verb here. Yeah. Karete, which comes from Cairo, meaning to rejoice, to be excited, to be full of joy when he writes to them, rejoice in the Lord always. Now, Paul of all people knew that the Christian life in this fallen world is not always sweet and rose. We know that, right? By experience. I mean, Paul suffered greatly for the Lord Jesus. When we read 2 Corinthians 11, we read how much Paul had to suffer for his faithfulness to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. After all, I mean, Paul is writing this from under house arrest in Rome while he's telling them, rejoice in the Lord. Paul never created an unrealistic expectation with any Christian or any congregation about the cost of discipleship in this fallen world. I mean, on the contrary to the young pastor, Timothy writes in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, the text that you probably know, to all who want to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. He reminds the believers in Acts chapter 14, 22, that through many hardships in this life, we must go come into the kingdom of God. And therefore, he reminds the Philippian believers in our text, that their joy is not vested in any person, in any place, in any pleasure, in any practice, in any perception in this world, but only where? What does verse 4 say? Rejoice in the Lord. That's where true and lasting joy is available. In a personal relationship with God in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul trained himself in this habit. It's a habit we need to train ourselves in, to find inner joy in the Lord, regardless of joyless external circumstances in this world. I mean, just turn with me over to Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. See what Paul writes here. Paul really learned this lesson. He trained himself in this habit. He says in Colossians 1 verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. While he was suffering in his ministry to the Colossian believers, he says, I rejoice where in the Lord. Also, uh, he's writing in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 10. He says that in this world, through the ministry, they experience many sorrows, but what does he say? They always rejoice in the Lord, clearly. And it was Paul's desire that the Philippians 
believers, but also you and I today, that we would also learn this lesson, that we would train ourselves in this habit at all times, every moment of every day of your life, to be a cheerful believer, trained by exercise in the same habit, to rejoice in the Lord. That's why it says rejoice in the Lord always. Always, not some of the time, not only when things are going my way, always, in every circumstance. This is, after all, why Christ saved us, is it not? I mean, John, Christ says in John 15, verse 11, I said these things to you that my joy, that Christ experienced in his walk with the Father, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy, therefore, may be complete. That's why we are saved, to experience the joy of the Lord, in the Lord, always. This matter of rejoicing is so important to Paul that he emphasizes it in the text. We know what emphasis means, or repetition means. It's, being, it, it's there to place emphasis on what he's trying to say. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. And this is not the first time that he's reminded them of this. Turn back with me to Philippians chapter 3. A chapter earlier he said, finally my brothers, in Philippians 3 verse 1, finally my brothers rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and it is safe for you. He's constantly hammering this point. And it's also Paul's desire that our inner joy would not remain within us, but that it would manifest outside of us, that we would live it out in this world as Christians. That's why he says here in verse 5, while he's speaking of joy in the Lord, he says to them, let your reasonableness, your kindness, your gentleness, all good translations of that Greek term there, let it be known to all people, to everyone. Kindness on the outside, reasonableness is the, the corollary, the manifestation of inner joy. I mean, when people from outside, unbelievers, look at you, they can't see the joy that you experience in the Lord. That is a deep, heartfelt emotion within the Christian. But they can see the effect of that on the outside, can't they? And how you treat them. Gentle, kind, with reasonableness. And you know what will happen? That kindness that flows forth from the joy that you have in the Lord will make your Christ attractive to them. And the Lord may grant you an opportunity with these people to share the hope that you have with him. And they might also come to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the motivation for this call from Paul in verses 4 and 5 to joy and to reasonableness, he says, is that the Lord is near at the end of his, the Lord is near. In Afrikaans, we will say, uh, this is a double sinner gestelling, means this phrase can have two meanings, and both are correct, according to biblical teaching. First, it means that Christ is near, he's at hand, that his presence is with us, that he is involved in our lives, in all of our external circumstances in this fallen world. But also that the coming of Christ is at hand and near. Both are correct. And the idea here is, since God is an ever-present helper, an ever-at-hand helper, let us not, or let us rather in the positive, rejoice in the Lord always and be reasonable to everyone. I want to illustrate this. Um, the story is told of a young courtier who worked in the palace of the Russian Tsar years ago. Uh, she was converted to the Christian faith, to the great chagrin unhappiness of the Tsar, because she couldn't keep quiet about the Lord Jesus and the joy she experienced in the Lord within his court. So he had a throne in jail in the most dire circumstances among the most godless criminals for an entire day, 24 hours. And after she spent that time there, he had her fetched, brought before him, and arrogantly asked, are you now ready to deny this Christ of yours and to return to the 
joy of my court. And this brave lady, her answer was, I have found more joy in Christ in the midst of the most dire circumstances, the most wicked criminals that I can find in your courts in a lifetime. No matter the external circumstances, we carry the joy of the Lord with us in our hearts. Now likewise, the Philippian believers, and also we are not to seek joy in anything, in any person in this world, not, uh, not even in those you love the most, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only genuine, the only lasting source of peace from God. And when we do that, we will experience the assurance of salvation that comes from God and also the promised peace of God in this world. I want to highlight a third guideline for us, not only to stand firm in Christ, not only to seek joy in Christ alone, but a third guideline here, to put trust in Christ. To put trust in Christ. Let me read us uh, verse 6 again. The Apostle Paul writes, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And when we do that, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The command here of Paul to the Philippian believers is that they should not be anxious. This does not mean that they should be carefree or unconcerned. There's a difference. You see, Paul was very concerned about the Philippian believers. That's why he writes to them from, uh, from Rome. If you turn back to chapter 2, verse 20, we see that. Paul writes, Philippians 2, verse 20, I have no one like him, talking about Timothy, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, by implication, as I am concerned about your welfare. Also in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, Paul says, along with all of these, my daily concern for the well-being of the churches. He does not write to them to be carefree or unconcerned, but to be without worry, to be without anxiety, because they've got a loving and a responsible Father, as you and I have in the heavens, who knows what we need. This we read in the Bible. Psalm 55, 23, cast your burdens on God, says the word of the Lord. Throw it off onto the Lord. Why? Because he cares for you. And just in case we missed it in the Psalms, the Apostle Peter quotes it in 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Cast your anxieties, your burdens onto the Lord, for he cares for you. There's a, let me explain it this way. The difference between being concerned and being anxious is basically this. Concern is a natural symptom, the fruit of true brotherly love in the Lord. If I love someone, I will be concerned about them, to pray for them. But chronic worry is a natural symptom, the fruit of unbelief in the Lord. Now Paul writes here that they should be anxious for nothing. Anxious for nothing. And he's basically... Quoting the Lord Jesus Christ, who said in Matthew chapter 6 from verse 31, Do not be anxious for what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall wear. For the unbelievers run around after these things. But you have a Father in heaven, he said, who knows what you need. For you, as for you, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and God will provide. All of these things that you do. Jesus in those verses are talking about a shift of perspective. A shift of focus. That the Christian should not be focused exclusively on their problems in this fallen world. Their needs in this fallen world. But rather shift focus to God who is the great provider in all our needs that we may experience in this world. And that's what the Apostle Paul also calls us to in this text. Rather than being anxious 
what does Paul say what we must do at the in the second part of verse 6, he says, Rather than being anxious, make your requests known to God by prayer. Because God alone is sovereign and able to change your circumstances in this world as he fit, sees fit, an answer to faithful and fervent prayer. Now, I want you to notice one or two other things in the text. Firstly, what the Christian must do bring to God in prayer is their requests. Paul is not teaching here that God stands ready like some type of genie in a bottle to grant our every fleshly uh, desire, our every lust. For example, for those new golf clubs or that new sport, sports motor or whatever the case might be. Everything that we desire that is fleshly, worldly. This would have been contrary to what the Apostle James writes. In James 4 verse 3, it says you have not because you don't pray. And you're praying, you don't receive anything from God because you're praying wrong. Because you're only praying for the fulfillment of your sinful and selfish fleshly desires, your lusts. No, Paul teaches that the Christian must make known to God through prayer those specific needs that arises from your challenging external circumstances in this world. And if those requests are in line with God's will, we know that 1 John 5 verse 14 says that God hears and God grants in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the sake of his glory. We bring our requests to God. Also notice Paul makes known what attitude we should come to God with. Um, he says here it should be with prayer and supplication along with thanksgiving. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. I.e. with the appropriate disposition of the creature before the creator. We don't come before our high and mighty sovereign creator arrogantly. Claiming and naming and all of those things. Demanding from God in prayer what we want in our sinful and selfishness. No, we come humbly before God. Through supplication, with thanksgiving, acknowledging that every good gift that we receive comes from the Father, as James 1 verse 17 says. Now, beloved, when I was young, I came to the Lord, I was saved when I was about 10 or 12 years old. The second book, Christian book that I had in my possession was the autobiography of, of George Mueller. And wow, what a book. I can recommend it to everyone. Every Christian should read that book. There was a pastor in Europe somewhere, and the Lord laid it on his heart to start three orphanages in the city that he ministered in for the kids on the street. And he did this all by faith. The Lord provided with great effectiveness. But he writes in this book that one morning, the, those who headed up the orphanages came to him and said, Mr. Mueller, there's no resources left. We've got no food. There's no way to feed these kids. They're hungry. What should we do? And George Mueller, with a firm faith that the Lord led him to start these orphanages, looking back at how faithfully God provided in the past, he told these orderlies, let the children sit for breakfast. And he came there. He prayed, he, he prayed with supplication and thanksgiving, as the text says. He reminded God of his great promises, thanking the Lord for his faithful provision. And uh, after he prayed, there was a knock at the door of one of these orphanages, and a delivery truck had just broken down outside the front door of that orphanage, full of bread. They were transporting the bread. They were waiting for the mechanic to fix the truck. They were afraid that the bread might go stale or whatever, and they donated it to the orphanage, and the Lord provided miraculously. And the Lord provides miraculously in many instances. Not always, but what I want to emphasize here is the firm faith of George Mueller in a trustworthy God. And likewise, the Philippian believers, as well as you and I, should not surrender to worry in the challenging external circumstances we face in this world. We should put our trust 
in God through prayer for his fatherly care in Christ. And that in everything, as the text says. And when we do this, we will experience that assurance of salvation and that promised peace that surpasses all understanding from the Lord. My beloved, will you stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you seek your joy in the Lord Jesus Christ? And will you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ in all your circumstances? And the Lord is faithful. He will grant us what he promises in verse 7. The peace of God will guard our hearts and minds in Christ. And the God of peace will be with us. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we face many hardships in this life. But thank you, dear God, that you are a faithful God, a faithful, loving, responsible Father in the Lord Jesus Christ to us, that you keep your promises and that you are always true to us, Lord. We thank you for that tonight. Lord, we want to confess the sinfulness of our murmurings, our unbelief. Lord, help us to do these things that Paul exhorts us to in the text, to stand firm in the Lord Jesus, immovable, to seek joy amidst joyless external circumstances that we face in Christ alone. And Lord, to put our trust in you through him by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And grant us this peace, Lord, that we know, oh, but so little of. Grant us this peace, that it might be our strength every day in the Lord. We pray this in the name above all names, in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.